So abemaciclib was approved by the FDA for two very interesting indications, uh, one of which kind of overlaps with ribociclib and palbociclib and one of which does not. I think that's probably the, even going to be the most important indication. So uh, abemaciclib was approved uh, by the FDA for a treatment of hormone receptor positive metastatic breast cancer that had progressed on an aromatase inhibitor uh, in use with fulvestrin. Okay, and that was based on the Monarch II trial. Uh, which was uh, a fulvestrin with or without uh, abemaciclib in women who had progressed on an aromatase inhibitor, either were on an aromatase inhibitor in the adjuvant setting or who had progressed in the metastatic setting. The important part of that particular trial was that the women did not have chemotherapy at all. And it really, in many cases, was a first line metastatic therapy, uh, but in people who had progressed on adjuvant aromatase inhibitors. The interesting thing about that trial is that the progression-free survival was about 16 and a half to 17 months. I think it was 16.7 months, uh, which is a lot higher than like the eight or nine months seen in um, uh, Mona Lisa and the Mona Lisa studies, as well as in uh, um, Paloma 3, uh, which were kind of similar um, uh, patient populations, except they were allowed to have chemotherapy. So it was a little bit later line uh, than um, with the bemaciclib. Uh, but the other really, and so therefore, it's got the same indication, you know, with fulvestrin as like a second-line therapy uh, for treatment of ER-positive metastatic breast cancer that progressed on the aromatase inhibitor. Um, but the, the unique um, uh, indication for bemaciclib is as a single agent in heavily pretreated metastatic breast cancer, patients who had had already um, uh, endocrine therapy and chemotherapy, I think, is the way the label was written, um, as a single agent. And that's based on the Monarch 1 trial, where these patients had a response rate of about 20% and had, I think, in the most recent data, an overall survival of about 22 months, which is quite high for that patient population. So I think that really is a novel uh, indication, and I think the one that a lot of us are going to use first in our practice. Uh, I think that, you know, these drugs clearly have changed the natural history of metastatic breast cancer that's ER positive. I think that it'll be a few years before we see the real world survival data, but I, uh, there's no doubt, even maybe in the clinical trials we don't see it, but I think when real world registry data and other kind of data, you know, EMR data comes out, I think that we are gonna see these drugs clearly, all three of them have, have moved the needle for the treatment of metastatic ER positive breast cancer. The issue is which drug to use when, I think is really the bigger issue. These approvals, I think, uh, the first approval was expected. I think that uh, the, were these approvals expected by the FDA, the FDA approvals expected? I think the first one was. I think that the Monarch 2 data was very clear, um, very similar to the, you know, to the Mona Lisa data and to the Paloma 3 data. Uh, and I think that uh, everybody's very excited about that. Um, what was interesting was the, was really, I think, the even more significant uh, label, which is really for the, the heavily pretreated patients. That trial, Monarch 1, was a 128 patient phase 2 trial that didn't meet its primary endpoint. The primary endpoint was a, was a response rate, I think, of 25%. It didn't meet it. And so everybody was like shocked. I think, but I think it's great. I think it's fabulous. I think it's very forward thinking of the FDA to do this. Um, I think that this is where I think this drug may make the biggest impact, at least initially, uh, in the treatment of metastatic breast cancer. So where will I use a bemaciclib at this point? I think that abemaciclib, clearly based on Monarch 3, is very similar in its efficacy uh, to ribaciclib as well as to palbociclib. The biggest issue in this first-line setting uh, is going to be diarrhea. There's going to be less neutropenia, but there clearly is more diarrhea and that has to be managed. And I think that it's going to be a real challenge to decide which one to use. I mean, I think that, you know, palbociclib really uh, is easy to give. The biggest side effect, to be honest with you, is neutropenia. Ribociclib is pretty much the same, although with ribociclib, there's some issues with QT prolongation and drug interaction, specifically with, say, antidepressants and anti-nausea agents. That can be problematic. Um, and again, you know, palbociclib, you know, the doses, there's not a lot of dosage flexibility. You have to order a completely new set of pills, you know, in somebody if, say, they need a dose reduction from 125 to 100. So, you know, all three of them have issues of various kinds, and I think it's going to depend on the physician's, you know, choice or comfort with that, with that particular agent. But I think they all work really well in that first-line setting, although it's not approved right now, actually. It's only approved in the second-line setting, uh, abemaciclib. In terms of the second line uh, with fulvestrin, um, again, I think all the drugs seem to be uh, about the same in their efficacy. I think the big difference in progression-free survival 
that we see in Monarch 2 is because these patients were less heavily pretreated. I think the rule of thumb is going to be you take whatever disease state you have with hormone therapy and you double the PFS with, an, with, a, a, with a CDK4-6 inhibitor. That seems to be where it is. And so, again, in that second line setting, the same issues apply. I mean, I think it's going to depend on individual physician comfort with the various side effects. You know, do we want to worry about dosage flexibility with, with, with palbo? Do we want to worry about QT prolongation and drug interaction with ribo? Or do we want to worry about diarrhea with abema? And I think that it's, again, it's going to be the individual physicians. I think they're all going to work really well. They're all really good drugs. They all really have moved the needle dramatically. And it's really going to depend on the physician's comfort with each individual potential side effect. I think the biggest area where abema is different from the other two is its single agent activity. I think the other drugs may have single agent activity, but I think the proof, you know, there's no big trials that have shown that. I mean, you know, we are presenting at San Antonio, our group, some data uh, in far advanced metastatics. It's very similar to the, to the, 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 the Monarch 1 population. We did an expanded access trial before a, a PALBA was approved, and we're actually presenting some clinical data and response data from those patients, actually, at San Antonio this year. So, you know, we'll have some data with other drugs. But on the other hand, I think Abema has the most uh, data, and it has the approval from the FDA. You know, the other two do not. And I think this is a really interesting idea. You know, people who have been heavily pretreated have had a lot of different therapies, maybe haven't had the CDK4-6 yet. You know, and I think this is, and this is an area, you know, where there's not a lot of things that are efficacious. And I think that people will tolerate the diarrhea a lot more, or ha ha tolerate having, having the diarrhea a lot more, put up with it, because you now have a therapy where you didn't have anything before. And I think that, to me, is where this uh, agent may actually uh, uh, at least start. I mean, it'll probably be used everywhere, but I think a lot of us will want to use it in that setting first. The big thing in managing the diarrhea from abemaciclib is to be proactive, is to really start antidiarrheals fairly early, let the patient know that diarrhea is going to be an issue, um, and that it can be controlled, and generally most people tack a phylax to it in one or two cycles, in one or two months of it. So I think that, again, especially in that heavily pretreated setting, uh, I think it's going to be really interesting to see the activity uh, in real-world life of a bemacyclid.